Straw Hut Media. We're better together with Ann and Heather. Today is a very special day. I'm better together with Ann and Heather because I have a very dear friend of mine, Sonia Cole, joining us today to not only talk about her life, but her accomplishments, the the stunning capacity she has had to fight war, literally, through her art. And it is not often that we get to share in this kind of knowledge. And I feel very privileged uh, to have you here, Sonia. Take it away, uh, Heather. Thank right. you so much, Lenny. T- Good to see you. Today we have Sonia Nasseri Cole. She's a filmmaker, an author, a human rights activist, and philanthropist. Born in Afghanistan, she has become a leading figure on refugee and women's rights. She founded Afghanistan's World, Fa- World Foundation and worked with world leaders to rebuild the lives of refugees around the world. Her leadership and charitable work was recognized with U.S. Congress Recognition Award, U.N. Women Together Award, and a peace medal by the UN. In 2013, she received the prestigious Freedom to Write Award by the Penn Center. Compelled to tell her stories to a wider audience, Sonia produced her first documentary, The Breadwinner, followed by her celebrated feature, The Black Tulip. Losing her crew to fear of death, she became the producer, director, actor, filming inside a war zone, which included death threats and kidnapping attempts from the Taliban. Wow. This does not sound like a normal day, folks. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, Sonia also authored the book, Will I Live Tomorrow? A behind the scenes account of the making of that movie. Her new film, I Am You, will be released on July 20th, and you can see it on Apple TV or Amazon On Demand. This film follows the journey of a young refugee who embarks on a perilous migration from Afghanistan to the unknown. Welcome, Sonia, into our Better Together tribe. Thank you for being here. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. Oh, you're welcome. We're so impressed. The more I researched you, the 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 more intrigued and 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 so much respect for what you have done and been through. And uh, I think our listeners are very lucky to be able to hear from you today. I amended that. I would like you, because I know that you are humble in a way that the wind is, I would like for you to tell us what you feel when you hear the extraordinary life that you led, of uh, just put into a bit of a summation, what, what, what that makes you feel like. Oh, that's such an interesting question. Um, it's like, who's that girl? <laughs> uh, it's very interesting because we, as women especially, uh, we feel like we are not capable of accomplishing things that normally it happens in the man's world. So when I hear that, I really truly realize that, yes, I did all that. And there are very few women that are filmmakers to begin with because the opportunities are not there for them. And now it's a little bit more, but almost none to go to war zone and make a movie. There are documentaries that some women have tried to do, but a feature film in the middle of war zones, there hasn't been many men either that have done it. <laughs> so it makes me think like, how powerful and strong we are and how underestimate we we underestimate ourselves. For me, you know, it's very interesting when you're sitting in the West and you have this lovely life and you decide to do something like that, you go, oh, if that happens, I will do that. When this happens, I immediately fly back. When that happens, I will not be able to take it because you just assume who you are based on experiences you haven't had. But once you are there and the bomb drops and Taliban comes after you and you get kidnapped and all these horrific things happens to you, you don't do what you thought you were going to do. So it always comes like a shock and surprise. Actually, honestly, probably the biggest revolution I had during this period of time making documentaries and films in Afghanistan and other countries as such I always feel like uh, it is 
an inner journey that I honestly, I learned so much about me more than anything else. I never forget the day I came home after four and a half months of being in war zone, Afghanistan. And I saw my face at the time I was living in LA and I, on the mirror that I've seen myself for so many years, and I looked at the mirror and these words came out of my mouth. It was like a whole other person I, I saw in the mirror from the girl that left. And I said, nice to meet you. Uh-huh. It came out loud. Wow. There are many things I would say that have come up with questions that we want to ask. And I wanted to begin um, this conversation with how I met you. But what I feel compelled to ask you, because people don't know, I want to keep it on a little bit of a train of thought about what it is and who we're talking to. We're speaking to a woman who shot the first full-length feature in Afghanistan during the Taliban reign and put herself on the line with, with so many people and face something that no one could understand. And I would like for you to tell the story from the first night that you were in the hotel and Oliver Stone's director of photography was committed and there to be your photographer for this unbelievable thing you were going to do. There are twofold questions. One, what was the black tulip? Two, why you wanted to do it? And two, the story of what happened. Are you in agreement, Heather, that we want to go just of right course. there, right away? Let's go. I want you to tell me what the Black Tulip is. So Black Tulip, um, I shot in 2010. And uh, 2011, part of 10 and 11. And uh, on location all over Afghanistan. Black Tulip was triggered to me to write the story and to make this film and a moment that I saw on on the news that a bomb explodes and the biggest Buddhist statue in the world that is in Afghanistan and Afghan uh, where Buddhism started in Afghanistan originally blew blew up and destroyed this majestic thing that, you know, to start top of a mountain. And I, t- in my heart, I said, they're destroying something that belongs to the world. Your children, your grandchildren, mine, will never get to see that. Yes. People from around the world came to Bamiyan to see the Buddha statues. And that was a moment that I said, why doesn't anybody do something about these Taliban? Yes. And then I said to myself, I am somebody. Why don't I do something about it? Well, that's rare and unique. Me, so I'm, I'm the one. <laughs> yeah. Please tell us the story of when you you crafted going over there. I'm the one. I'm going to do it. And now I'm going to put my crew together with no small crew. This is Oliver Stone's director of photography. This is These are people that are the top rated artists. I'm going over here. I'm doing it. I wrote it. I'm going to do it. And then you landed. And what happened? Uh, landing in Kabul with my crew, which is all American, uh, you know, the, the key crew, of course, all American and some and my actors. Um, I arrive in Kabul. The first thing I see as we land is all these white flags it, it spread out the entire airport. And I asked this, there was an Afghan man sitting next to me and I said, what are these flags? And he goes, oh, those are for mines. These are for plane to avoid because these are all mines that the Soviet Union had put there. Just just that moment alone, you get a chill in your bones like, oh, this is serious. We're just, any minute could be hitting a mine. And then arriving at the airport and half of the airport is blown up and the other half is open and you're going through these. And I remember that airport it was the most beautiful airport with all the flags, restaurants, and gorgeous airport. It's just unrecognizable. And you're coming to your country after such a long time with an American passport. 
And I'm Afghan. So if you're born in Afghanistan, you don't need to have a visa or anything. You'll be able to enter Afghanistan. I give my American passport and this tall guy in the back look, looks at me and start waiting and waiting on me. And then finally he um, takes it to another supervisor, another supervisor. I'm like, my God, they're going to cut my throat. Maybe this guy's Taliban, who knows? And then he just said, Welcome home. Welcome and home. Can, he knew you. He saw you. Can I ask a question that that may be a silly question, but when how, how do you, can you tell if somebody is Taliban when you're there? Like, how would you be able to identify somebody as Taliban, or would it be very clear? I can. You can, but but how? I but I couldn't. You probably no. You could too. There is a way about them that as an Afghan, I know what Afghan disposition is, how they smile, how they speak. First of all, they they don't understand uh, Islam at all. None of them know about Islam. It's uh, They are Wahhabis. So they are in the religion of Wahhabism, which is from Saudi Arabia, which is an umbrella uh, under the umbrella of Islam. They're hijacking Islam. So they speak with a very heavy accent. They color their eyes black. They put black turbans. They ride motorcycles. There is a lot of signs, and there is a cruelty in their eyes that even an, yeah. you can't see it in animals. The worst of the animals, the wildest animal, you don't see that ice cold mm -hmm. thing that is in their eyes. Oh. I'll just tell you briefly, you know, I was born in Afghanistan. My father was a diplomat. I was raised in Europe most of the time, but I came to Afghanistan when the Soviet invasion happened. I ha I was in Afghanistan and I escaped um, Afghanistan by myself and came to the United States. And I had a very difficult time as a young girl of 15 being in America. A lot of bad things happened. And I never went to Afghanistan. My family came two years later. This was December of 1979, right after the invasion of Soviet Union that I came to the States. Wow. And I was all alone and really having the most difficult time. That's where my book is going to be, what it's like to be a refugee and how you survive and become somebody. It really changed me. My youth changed completely during that period of time. My teenage years were destroyed. And I came here, I got married very young, had a son, and never went back to Afghanistan until I saw a documentary that Dan Rather did. And I saw a woman barefoot walking in the snow with two babies in her hand. And it, she's freezing and the kids are freezing and they're in borders running away from the Russians. And that's when I said, I have to do something about it. And I wrote a letter to President Reagan and President Reagan responded and my life changed that day. My, I realized who I want to be, what I want to do in my life. I want to fight for the voiceless. I want to do something about what's happening in my country. And that became my mission of life. I How think old were you? I, Sorry. <laughs> uh, six, 17, six, 15, 16, 17. This was my life. And I went and testified. I went, uh, President Reagan asked me to go to Afghanistan. I went with a group of people in Afghanistan uh, to testify in front of the Senate to get the Stinger missile approved for Afghanistan. We, I testified. We got the Stinger missile approved, but my, uh, I, I was on fire. I, there was so much I could do at this point. So I kept doing. <laughs> well, events. I think I had read some. I I had read somewhere that when you were in the Oval Office with President Reagan, that he said to you, it, it takes just one person to change the world. Do you want to be that person? And I thought that was a really incredible thing for him to have said. And you really did become that person. Very true. It was, had a, it was the most powerful moment of my life because I became somebody that moment when he said, you want to be that person when the most powerful man in the world tells you something like that, you become so empowered. Like you think I can, of course I can. 
And my life was never the same after that. I had a mission. I was a woman with a mission. Yes, I can and I will. And and I had no fear. Just knowing that somebody like the most powerful person in the world thinks you can. I needed to have a little bit of that understanding so that people under so that people could really um, hold what Sonia has done to get out and then to go back in to choose. Now we're back from Ronald Reagan. We're a sixteen-year-old b- 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 teen on fire. Yes, I get married. Life goes on. My and life goes on. Life always was when I was a little girl. You know, I was 11 years old or 12 years old. I was with my father watching a cowboy movie, a John Wayne movie. And he asked me, how did you like the movie? And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> so if the horse was standing there when the double door opened and he came this way, the guy would have not been able to shoot him. He should have come the other way. <laughs> and my dad said, what? <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. Anyways, you don't understand it. That's fine. <laughs> but well, we're talking about in my point head. of view, you were already directing in perspective. And we come directing, into the Black yeah, Tulip. You were directing, directing and you wrote vision. a, uh, you did not write a documentary. You wrote b- a, a love story to, b- which is what I would consider the Black Tulip is. Is that correct? And now I'm going to jump into. Oh, definitely. B- it's a love story. But and now I want to jump into Heather's of question of what the hell happened the second you arrived. Now, you arrived to shoot the Black Tulip, a love story to your country. You go into the hotel and b- let us begin. Uh, so we arrived at, um, at the hotel and the same afternoon we, we we walked around a little bit but you were just very jet lagged so everybody went to sleep and at 4 45 a.m i was i was awake at two and i asked for a, a tea and they brought me tea and a piece of bread and i had a little tray in my hand and a bomb exploded And I thought the bomb was at the hotel. My tray and my cup of tea and everything hit the ceiling and came back. And I just went crazy. And people all came out of their rooms and everybody was screaming. And I thought the hotel was bombed. And I went to bang at the cinematographer's room. And uh, bang, bang, bang. And he's like, come on, get out. Let's go. Let's shoot. Bring the camera. (laughs) You're like, let me get some (laughs) B-roll. Yeah. And he had his backpack on and he said, I, 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 I'm leaving. <laughs> and listen, he just said something so powerful to me. He said, I said, well, why? And he said, bomb just dropped. And I said, yeah, but that's what, did you do research? I mean, I told you we're going to war zone. And he said, I didn't think it would be right here. And he's he reminder Oliver a, Stone's cin- cinematographer. So this, this is yeah. this is not a pussy. And yeah. he said to me, and he's a six foot six man. And he looked at me and he goes, "You're ready to die. I'm not." And it was so powerful. And I said, "Yes, I respect that." I said, "I will get you on the first flight. I will make sure you're safe at the airport. You get on the flight and you make it." to Dubai and from Dubai I organized for your flight back. It was Indian embassy next door that blew up and 157 people got killed Jeez. that day. It's the first day. So you're down one. <laughs> so down Jack. one and it went on and on and on. I got a new cinematographer that flew in, David McFarlane. He's incredible. Love this guy and he's a huge cinematographer now and I will work with him over and over again. He came and saved your day. Thank God for that courage. But then the light producer left and the light producer took his, uh, had an affair with the associate producer, American girl, took her with him too. And then the set designer left. I mean, it just went on and I kept replacing and they kept leaving and, there came a point that I was doing pretty much everything. One of the stories I want to tell is about the money and how you got your film out of Afghanistan. The other one is a story about the actress and what you confront when you are confronting the Taliban. 
when I did the documentary Breadwinner in um, Kabul, I was in Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul, and I saw a woman, a beautiful woman, sitting with a black pantsuit, a red shirt, sandals, open toe. I was like, my God, you don't see anybody without like that sitting at, at those days. We're talking about 2000. Um, eight or seven in Kabul. And everyone folk- was covered. There was a shroud over all of the women still. Well, I think it's yeah, important for burka, us to understand they just, this. They don't, they don't, it was very scary time. And I just said, wow, you're beautiful. I was waiting for somebody. And she said, thank you. So what are you doing here? She said, I'm Afghan, but I live in Pakistan. And I came here because I'm an actress for a tea commercial and I'm going back. So I'm just auditioning for the tea commercial. And I said, you're an actress. And she said, yes. And I said, listen, I'm writing a film. Maybe in a couple of years, I come back here and I want to shoot this film and I'm looking for somebody like you. Would you be interested in working and being the, in the film? But I said, I want to tell you it's against the Taliban. And um, so it's a dangerous film to, to shoot. And he goes, oh, I've already done a movie anti-Taliban in Afghanistan, in, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. I'm not scared of them. Of course I want to do it. Here's my cell number, blah, blah, blah. So we stayed in touch every day, every day, every week, every month, twice a month. We would talk about the film, about the story, about shooting. And I got the date and everything was just perfect. Until two months before the shoot, I cannot find this woman, my life depended on it anywhere. She doesn't answer her computer. She normally would receive a gift from me. She would open the gift and call me, thank you for the phone, thank you for the backpack from my friend. I mean, just stupid things that I would send to her. She would always respond. No response. And I got really worried, like what happened to her. Came to Kabul. And this time, the moment I got my Afghan phone, Afghan phone number, I called her. And she answered the phone and she told me that the, that uh, she said, uh, it's so hard to tell the story. She says, you remember? I, I told know you it I is. I know the it is. Taliban. I'm here and for I, you. I know. Yes. And she said that the, the Taliban chopped my feet off. So I will not be able to do your movie. I literally like, my heart dropped and I started, I said, what? I started crying like I couldn't imagine it. And she said, make this movie for me. Don't stop. Find somebody and make this film. I- and, uh, and I said, I don't know. I don't know who to find. You know, it's, it's very dangerous. Obviously, I can't have an Afghan do it because they could chop that person's feet and, and this was known men and women they taliban chop their feet of their artists uh, film actors sing, uh, you know singers it's it's happened to many of them and i and she said you do it i you never should. forget i was like no that's not the question so i wanted to pack up and leave and then uh, the american crew said we're here now That's we're right. not going let's you jump in and do this so imagine i said i'm gonna go back i went to my crew and i like i i i have to go back to Af- um, america and cast somebody in america and bring her and take her back with me and they said no we are that already- didn't happen did it yeah already we're on the roll so what happened what happened who stepped in <laughs> So I, I jumped in, but I cut the part to a half because I had to direct, I had to produce. I, I was wearing You had to hide all of the money to pay off all the Taliban? In one minute and the next minute, I was this lovely lady with the scarf and dress. I was like, just so well, difficult. The- Let's talk about the black tulip for one second, because then I'm going to. I want to get on to your new movie. But the fact of the matter is, what happened after that is that you became the lead of your movie. Now, I was out of touch with you at that time. I did not know. I knew you were going to shoot. 
But, but if you skip to a very b- b- kind of funny moment, we'd like to try to lift, lift the layers. Let's lift us up a little bit from the horror of that, which is what you were trying to do with your movie. And you did. Sonny comes back. Okay. She says so to me, I have all of the film in my jacket. All of the film, every single thing. She had so many thousands of dollars in her vest pockets, in her jacket. No, I have a million dollars in my pocket. That's why the coat was called the million dollar coat. Because there is no banking in Afghanistan. I don't think it still is, but uh, at, at, I, I don't think it exists now. No credit card, no check, no nothing. Everything is cash. So wow. I put it on a, a, a goose, a Canadian goose coat. Yep and uh, stuffed it all with the goose and sewed it in. And I was walking with that coat all the time, everywhere. Even and when you were kidnapped I, and taken off your set and put it in the back of a car and in a trunk and you paid through your literal inside pockets, did you not? Yeah, yeah. And nobody could see. I just had a little hole, a little zipper. I would go in and all of a sudden, $10,000 cash appears. <laughs> um, where ex- is that coat? Where is that coat now? Do you, did you keep it? This or? is no interesting question. This is a crazy question. I've been trying to get rid of this coat four <laughs> times. I give it away to somebody and then it comes back to me for some <laughs> reason. Say, oh, I took it from my daughter. My housekeeper said, and the coat doesn't fit her. So I brought it back to you. I'm like, oh my God, why? <laughs> then I gave a whole bunch of my clothes away. They took everything. They brought that coat back because they said, oh, <laughs> we found your keys in it that was attached and sewn into the coat. We couldn't take it. We didn't want to take it off. They brought the coat again. It was probably so to I, your hotel I, room in, in, in Afghanistan. The way it comes back to me three times, it's come back to me. Yeah, well, it's here. It's going to go yeah. into a museum. Right. All right. I have, a, I have a question for you that I think is important for our listeners to understand um, that can you highlight for us just what it's like, the differences, um, because I think that as American women, we oftentimes take for granted the freedoms that we have. And so I'd, I'd like for you to just educate our listeners on some of the freedoms that, that women in Afghanistan do not have. What a great question. Amen. First of all, freedom is not free. All the American women above us have fought all for so long to be free. And that was not long ago. The unfortunate thing uh, about Afghanistan is Afghanistan was one of those countries that before European women, American women even knew what equality of right was, they were free if you can imagine that. I have pictures of Afghanistan that women are wearing micro mini skirts, you know, on the streets of Kabul with the boys hanging and going to same school together. These are great grandmas now, but they were very free. That didn't exist anywhere in that part of the world, Central Asia, Middle East, that didn't exist. In Europe, you didn't see it quite like that. It was really open society. The suppression of the eight years of the Taliban um, tyranny on women is probably the worst thing that happened to send women backward in the history of the world. It never happened like that, that a free society, free women, uh, all of a sudden be covered and pushed back and beaten and have their nose cut off, their lips cut off, their breasts cut off, just because they were women. And to take them out of society, imagine you're being a top surgeon in a hospital and you're a woman and your husband is a clerk in some um, uh, ministry and she is the breadwinner of the family. He just makes a little money. You lock this woman and the husband can't even support his family now. So it went to something horrific. And now it's getting, it was getting a little better in the last 10 years. We Women start fighting and fighting. And now we have women ambassadors 
actually the ambassador to United Nations is a woman from Afghanistan. The ambassador to Washington, D.C. Uh, is a woman from Afghanistan. And they are ministers. They are very powerful. They are doing really well. Of course, the suppression of the Taliban among the villages and all that's still happening, without a doubt. But these women are fighting, fighting, fighting. The scary part about what's happening in our politics right now is, as you know, two days ago, Karzai was here, not Karzai, Ashraf Ghani, our president, was here to tell uh, uh, President Biden that Taliban are taking over every day, uh, city by city, village by village, and they are going to destroy women and take them back to where it was. This, the, the thing that scares me the most is they're gonna, the woman's going to say, we're going to fight. And he goes, uh, who are you going to call now? America came and stayed there for 20, 30 years, and they failed. Who are you going to call? You lost. Well, it's interesting because Afghanistan, if, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's one of the few countries that's never been, never been conquered. conquered or that's never right. been, right? You're right. Absolutely. And there's been a never. lot of attempts. In that part of the world, there is no country like that. Alexander the Great tried twice and failed in Afghanistan. Genghis Khan tried at least two, three times he failed. Russia, 10 years, we brought an end to the Soviet Union as we know it, to the uh, evil empire, finished. Uh, uh, Russia came down uh, because of Afghanistan. That was the one country they thought, oh, it's like, a, like another Bolshevik country. I'm going to take a bite and swallow it really quickly, like Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania. Oh, no, they forgot. They didn't do their homework that this is a country you cannot conquer. <laughs> And it destroyed Soviet Union. America, with all its mighty and power, failed. We are not pulling out. We failed. A fact is a um, fact. We didn't kick the Taliban out. And there out. have been some hero we wars. And the, the amazing thing about that. Afghanistan is that there are hero wars. And it happened in Egypt. And it happened in Greece. And it happened with people who are the powerhouses where I think we're beginning to... Um, be able to speak openly. I swear to God, Sonia, you are the joy of my life in speaking so truthfully about other countries. One of the things that we talk about on Better Together is that we are going to learn something. And here today, one of the things that I have always wanted to state is that we do not pay attention to the countries that we don't have any news about. The problem is we are we are void of information. And that's something we want to change around here on Better Together to allow the information to come through. And I think we're at a point because of what we have all gone through, the zero point that you and I have talked about, Heather, that we are all connected in some way. What we went through does deserve compassion and understanding that every human being went through something during COVID that that is not the same story, but is an effect. And uh, in that open is door such- is an understanding for compassion, for understanding, for living in a conscious thought that another community, another country, another nation, another world, another something we don't understand globally is and has the presence because of our openness to be understood and hear the stories and you're the beginning of us on a better together being able to literally kick open the door to the true stories that have gone on you have been fighting fit for this for a long time i'm happy to be your partner in it uh sonia uh with afghanistan but this is a mission that we can have and i think Sonia, you could be our ambassador to women and men who have the stories to tell about the other countries what they've been through what we are going through in the unifying which i understand is the basis of your heart and your connection to us all through storytelling and i thank you for being the first of ours to be um an an international voice to tell us what the truth is very important statement thank you you know if anything honestly honestly if anything COVID taught us was how interconnected the whole world is. A disease in China can attack the entire world. We're over there. We are here. Brazil is over there. You can imagine how a disease- Not us. We've had so many walls. Aren't our walls strong enough to stop that? No, it's not, sir. Exactly. That's why we are a one human race. We are we don't have color. We don't have anything. We are one people. We have to support and love each other and take care of each other and the world as one. It is so important politically and to answer to your question. I swear to God, Afghanistan was screaming, screaming 
saying Taliban are here, help us, help us. They're destroying women, they're killing women. I was fighting for it every single day, trying in every way, shape or form I can to inform uh, Americans about what's happening in Afghanistan. Well, that's over there. And some people say, isn't mm. that in Africa? I mean, is it happening everywhere in Africa? No, first of Just all, Just because it's it starts with an A doesn't mean it's the same country. <laughs> But one, one of the but things that I, 11 happened from mm-hmm. there and why it happened from there because we didn't hear the cries of the people of Afghanistan that were suppressed by this evil that evil these Arabs these Yemenis came and attacked the United States because they had free ground in Afghanistan to organize it because we sent Osama bin Laden which was CIA trained in Afghanistan to do our dirty work and then we didn't pick them up to send them back to Saudi Arabia, wherever the hell, Yemen, wherever he came from. And that was the cause of what your, your point is. What, when human right is violated anywhere, is violated everywhere. We have to see the world like well, that. Well, that, that was the past. What the reality is right now is that that truth is actually being seen and confronted us through a disease and and but and unified us, unfortunately, in the fact that we are, whether or not you believed it or not, whether or not you, you wanted to draw a line between us and you or they or them or anything else, that was an idea. But now the truth is out. We're all the same. We all got affected by something. It's going to be hard to pick up an M16 and blow somebody, some kid's head away when your grandfather was just lost. And so is my grandmother. That's going to be, so we're in a very tenuous, beautiful opportunity to gain our trust for each other to say you plus me equals we. But yeah. what we're talking about when we talk to you is about bringing down the walls and the barriers, whether they are a, a, a solid foundation or a mental or an emotional foundation to understanding that we're one people. I want to talk to you next about your next movie and uh, what it is that you have to share with us about that boundary. It's... Um from this conversation, I hope people take one thing that we are completely interconnected and we have to take care of each other, the entire human race. And we don't have borders. Human race doesn't have borders. I am you. We are passionate. <laughs> Is that the I title? Am I am you. You are me. We are one. Like seriously, that's why I made I am you. Because it's always explain like, oh, the refugees and the good people. What's the difference? Uh, who, who is not refugee in America? Except unless you are an American Indian. No, All that's of right. these are refugees. And the most beautiful, most incredible discoveries, science came from refugees. Einstein was a refugee. If he didn't get in, we wouldn't have had Einstein. And you know, America is collecting these incredible people from around the world, the best of the best, comes and give it their all to this country. Well, you gotta know, once they shot, you know, once they put Galileo or whatever into you know, the prisons, you know, but then Christopher Columbus comes along, you, go, you know, I think there's something more than a flat earth. Like, uh, we can either lock him up or we can send him on a ship. Like, who knows? He's gonna die anyway. But let's get these kids across the border. Everything we ever do is put our kids in the front line to go and fight our battles. But hello, we, in, we encountered another human that was of this place. And the only place is that you were an American Indian, period. You were the only people who belonged here period we're made of refugees we're made of refugees i mean if i uh, i'm a refugee myself as you know you and i had long stories conversation over the last 25 years that i know you um now the film it, is from I, the viewpoint of a refugee correct is well this is the thing tell us a little about it this, yes, is, my, this is my point of view heather on this one Mm -hmm. So I believe that America has laws, rules, and regulation, and it should be respected. I came properly, you know, waited, got the paperwork done. Uh, I came as a political asylum, and then it took me years to become, uh, get a green card, become an American citizen. You do things properly. But there are people, there, there, there is a difference between migration and refugees. 
refugees are people who we go to their countries. As a matter of fact, yesterday we put a whole bunch of bombs in Syria and Iraq. Nobody talks about it. Nobody has seen it. We don't see any picture like Anne says. We don't know anything that's going on in the world. We just know this one building that crashed yesterday. That's all we know right now. And that's all we talk about the entire news. The world is flipping out. Are Nobody you talking about, about the, the building in Miami? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Heather, it's for telling 24 me. 24 7 on the news. Very sad. Right, they feed us. Yes. But this kind of stuff is happening around the world all day long. Yes. But we don't get even a glimpse of it. No. So we just bombed Syria and we just bombed Iraq. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the politics of it. But there is always innocent people get killed during these bombings. So we have a moral obligation as America that when we bomb a country that we have to take those people that we kill their families, destroy their villages, destroy their churches, their synagogue, their um, uh, mosque, and say, okay, you can come to America, we'll help you. But God forbid one of those kids decide to come to America, oh, you must be a terrorist, you're coming from Syria, oh no, you're not allowed. This is where is very unfair. I think these people that are coming from different parts of Latin America should go through, truly through check and all that. But there are some really desperate. No mother will throw two of their little babies, four-year-old and two-year-old, from a wall on the ground. Yeah, no mother. We're, I'm a mother. Your mother. We cannot imagine throwing our baby across the wall to some strange place, not knowing anybody's going to find it or not find it. This is a desperate situation. But when you see a whole bunch of young men, you know, uh, 30s and 40s in good health and all that, coming for a better life because they don't like their country, they don't like the education in their country, there is no job, they should go through methodical and proper um, uh, procedure because that's what a country with border does. So but we need to start building the bridges in the scenario where there aren't steps that are uh, missed because of the opportunity we have to learn about the privilege to have a bridge between all of our countries. And that's a, uh, that's a work True. in progress. We are on it. True. Where I came from and where I lived in Iraq, I, I lived in Baghdad. So I, 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 I've been in Syria. I've been in Syria during madness i've been to turkey all the places that the refugee situations are very 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 scary and every country has their own point of view but the one thing that i think it's dividing americans is they don't understand the difference Thank you. of desperation of somebody that comes to this country because if your daughter's nose and breast was cut off and was raped by taliban all day long and you finally get her out you don't want anybody asking too many questions. You just want to come in. But if you are in a, a country like Guatemala and you have a life, but it's a very poor life, not a great life, your children that, that are not getting great education, you want to get a better life, that's migration and it should happen by us fixing those countries that are corrupt and this, this the most horrific way treating their people, we should fix the politics because we're Americans. That's our job to go to countries like Guatemala, like Venezuela, and talk with the leaders okay. and see what's the problem. Listen, Superwoman. We don't have this migration problem. Listen, Superwoman. I'm going to boost up because this is why we need an ambassador. We want to go step by step. First, we need the education. And I think we can begin with, because I'm a little bit of a simpleton, but I'm also really fun, as you know. <laughs> well, um, I think that for people listening today and hearing what you've said and all that they've learned about what's going on in countries like Afghanistan, what is something that people can do here right now to help? Is there anything that people can do here? Give us our first takeaway. President Reagan said what one person doing? makes a difference when yes. we have lots of people. Yes, you what you're doing, okay. what I'm doing, talk about talk it. Talk about it. It's not okay. We should have, as Americans, not accept this as it said normality okay it i'm going to call you out on that because one of the things that we do here on better together is to not start with a negative so better so, together you see we will be better together 
But what, yeah, that's what we hope. So when we look at our week this week and we go, one of the things that I want to take away, we talk about if you're going to listen to Better Together, take away, become better or feel better when you leave. I feel better that I have a little bit but, and by the way, it's a beginning conversation, a little bit of a connection to Afghanistan uh, that I've not had before, you know, right, like I'm open. A lot because you've been well, a part of this, you're on the board of Afghanistan yeah, World Foundation. I am. For and I'm going to go back to the beginning of how I met you because I do want to honor Natalie in this. And when uh, I'm talking about Natalie, I mean Natalie Cole. Natalie. And when I met Sonia and uh, Natalie, I was at my other friend's um, um, race to race MS event and it was bigger than the emmys and i didn't understand that at the time i thought it was like a c-list celebrity which i probably was but whatever i'm i come down the uh, mountain and see how many people are supporting this gorgeous woman nancy davis and i come down and out of the uh, we're at the hilton out of the doors come these two most gorgeous women which when you watch us on youtube on monday you'll be able to see out of the doors splash natalie cole and Sonia Cole, the woman you are going to be lucky at. And they are from head to toe, I swear to God, it's like a sparkle center. It was so beautiful. I had to turn up like, oh my God. And I think I said this, do you remember this moment? I go, holy fuck, who are you two? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. And Natalie turns around and looks at Annie and goes, well, I know who you are. <laughs> and she looks back and she goes to her husband, he goes, that's Natalie Cole. <laughs> and Natalie goes, this is my uh, my dearest friend, Sonia Cole. And you went, what? <laughs> Are you related? <laughs> no. And literally, that's how I met her. And our friendship started with Natty for years to come. We never, ever were not friends until I went to Afghanistan. And you didn't know because I didn't tell anybody for security reasons and then i came back and she jumped right in and we're gonna be doing this she you came when we won all the awards and the oscar nomination the, well the, the incredibleness oscar. was that natalie of course i learned about your very special friendship and she wrote the song for your movie well for black tulip and I you wanted to go over, of course, into the middle of the war zone in, in Afghanistan. I was like, I'm going, I'm going. And, and both calls are like, no, you're not going. You have two young kids, both you're calls. not going. <laughs> ah, fuck, I'm going. Like, no, you're not going. And they're like, they literally were going to do the premiere in the center of the town where, where, where all the, the Afghanis, if I'm saying that correctly, could come and see. So they literally helicoptered in both Sonia and Natalie from the top of the theater where where uh, Sonia wanted to premiere her movie for the for the for the for the people of her community, and and Natalie oh, yeah, like they, they literally that. dropped in and dropped right back out, and she's saying in the center of the court, no. Oh my God, Natalie <sighs> came with me. Finally, the film uh, was the official submission to the Academy Awards from Afghanistan, and Natalie says. I said to Natalie, I gotta go. A part of the qualification is to open the movie in the country of origin. Oh no. So I said, oh, going. Oh. And she said, I'm coming with you. And Natalie was sick. She had needed oxygen. She had kidney problems. She was on dialysis. And she would not listen to me. She says, I am going. going. I'm going. This is a dream of mine in life. I'm going. She comes there, she performs for 100,000 troops at Bagram base with General Petraeus. She goes to the embassy, performs at the embassy. She comes to the middle of the theater in Kabul and sings. And all the Afghans, like, they don't know who she is. And she's singing and, and forgettable on stage before they open the movie. I'm looking at her like, and she wears this white scarf, like <sighs> Afghan style. God bless her soul. God, I loved her so oh, much. Oh, we love you, Natalie. I mean, if this is not such a beautiful thing to take away. The enjoyment of our friendship. I actually think I buzzed you in the middle. You're like, Natalie's coming here right now. And she's like, ah. I was so jealous that I couldn't get oh, to be there, of I course. Know. But the the things that we we, we were going to take you away our friendships, then. and oh. I, I did. I had a baby then, and, and yeah. uh, we've ne known each other since then. And I just want to say how grateful we are that you're here. This is a continuing conversation because um, we now have you have as our expert. We're going to be better with Sonia. We're going to learn about our love for them for everyone. Oh, do you have any? Is other there way anything to that, that you didn't cover that you want to cover? Otherwise. 
Well, all I wanted to talk about was IMU. So IMU is the story of three Afghan refugees. A young boy of 18 that the father gets slaughtered in front of his eyes by the Taliban and because he wanted to go to Germany and take his family. The morning he's ready to go, that's what happens to his father. And the son assumes the position of the father and decides to go on the same journey from Afghanistan to Iran, to uh, Turkey, to Greece and Munich. In this car trip, there is a pregnant Afghan doctor that is 25 year old young woman and an old man that has an album that wants to take to Turkey to give to his grandchildren before he dies. So these people are in this trip and the film is about what it's like to be a refugee. First of all, why you leave your country? Nobody mm -hmm. wants to leave their mm -hmm. culture, their people, their home, their language, mm -hmm. their family, nobody. They leave because they have no choice. Because mm -hmm. they're going to die. And in the movie, you see how the threat is so alive on this boy and his family. So he makes this decision, actually is forced by his mother to leave. And then the doctor, the young girl doctor, that they, their husband gets killed because he doesn't like Taliban and he gets assassinated by the Taliban in a square. She um, is wants to leave because she's pregnant with a little baby and a daughter and she wants her daughter to be free and not be born in the in Afghanistan against under the Taliban regime. And the old man, as I said, the story. So, so what you're journey. telling us, Sonia, is that you like to do comedies. <laughs> 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 Listen, you oh, love. Honey. You know, you know. I'm always gonna. I'm always gonna give yeah, you. It's well, really fun. What I want to do is do a follow up because what I want to do is talk about once this movie comes out. But what I want to do also is let you know that the the heaviness of life is also our lightness of being. When we have the ability and the comprehension to be able to come to a story that is something that we can not understand what happens when we have a filmmaker like Sonia Cole is to be able to go in and feel ourselves within that other. That is why I Am You is so important because we get the open heart understanding conversation of, you know what, folks, we are not that different. In fact, we are exactly the same. And we live as one. And until next time, let us live in loving kindness. And don't be a dick. <laughs> We're better together with Anne and Heather. Well, that was a that was a, a, a deep conversation, Miss Sonia Call. What did you take away from this today? Well, I mean, it, it, it makes me grateful for um, for a lot of things that I think we take for granted, and um, it it also makes you kind of confront your own courage. I know that we were all talking about that six foot six guy who bailed to the airport. Totally. I can't promise you that I wouldn't have been him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, courage. I can't promise you that. Um, that's some, you know, you, it, it, and her bravery, I just find admirable. Sonia Cole is a woman with balls. And I will tell you, she went out of the phone. Afghanistan with her film tucked and sewn into her jacket so that she could escape with the footage because she knew that Salvan wouldn't let her do that. It is such an incredible interview. Uh, it was for me an experience and I hope everybody else enjoyed it as much. And a big thanks to our Better Together team, Ryan Tillotson, Sebastian Alcala, Daniel Ferreira, and of course, Anne and Heather. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whatever device or platform you're listening to this on. And as always, see you next week. We're better together.